Hi, I'm Mitra Sorrell, senior reporter at Focus Wire, and I'm delighted to be your host for today's New Reality With. This series of one-to-one interviews with industry leaders is sponsored by Medallia. Technology is helping hotels transform up to 80% of guest experiences into contactless interactions. Learn more from the leader in customer experience at medallia.com. For today's episode, we welcome Fred Lalonde, founder and CEO of Hopper, an app-only personalized travel recommendation and booking platform. Fred, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's jump right in here. Thinking back to those early days and weeks of the pandemic, is there anything you would do differently knowing what you know now? Well, we were um, pretty lucky in our misfortune because we, um, we sell in about 120 countries. So we started seeing um, a lot of things slow down in Australia and New Zealand early where, um, so we were, we were starting to freak out very, very early on, on in this thing. Um, and even before that, a lot of our conversations at the end of 2019 internally um, were about something going wrong in 2020. Mm-hmm. And obviously we, we got it wrong by an order of magnitude. The kind of things we were discussing were nothing like the year that we've, we've had in the industry. Um, but we'd, we'd already started um, a preventive fundraising round in November. Um, we were also very, very nervous um, just around the stock market itself. That part, you know, as of right now, it turns out that we, we were wrong. The stock market's been doing good. But I was preparing 2020 to look a little bit like uh, 20, 2008 um, yeah. after the financial crash. So out of just excess paranoia, like I think we, we did a good job preparing for this. Um, the other part, and we can talk about this in a bit, is that we were right in the midst of shifting our business to uh, be majority financial service, risk-based products and things like that, which turned out to be both awesome and terrifying and what happened throughout of that. So um, I think we were just very lucky in our timing and we were just as unfortunate ever, as everybody else and the rest. Okay, so we'll get to some of that about the shift that you made, but let's first just touch on that funding round. That um, was announced in mid-May, I believe, that it closed. Can you just give us a sense of it? That was developing pre-COVID, you just indicated. Um, how does that play out then as the pandemic starts? Yeah, very messily. It was it was <laughs> probably the single hardest thing. You, you have to remember, um, I think the round closed in the first week of March and we actually sort of didn't announce it. Okay. Um, and, and the reason was it, you know, you had layoffs. We had to cut a, a substantial amount of our team as everybody else in the category did, but you had massive layoffs everywhere in the travel industry. Um, startups were dying, established companies were running out of money. Um, and also if you remember, we were running out of toilet paper, like people didn't know if this was going to be the zombie apocalypse. We had no idea what was going to happen. The virus itself was, wasn't very well known. The mortality was being overstated. It was really scary. If anybody, you know, wants to have PTSD and remember what the, 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 the spring looked like. Um, so it just felt completely obnoxious and wrong to talk about us raising all this money. It just, it was just felt ridiculously wrong to do both for the colleagues that we had to let go and anybody else who was suffering in the industry. So we just didn't announce it. Um, Building it was challenging. Um, so our, our timing um, was actually, was it, the, the initial round would have been a lot larger. So to give you a sense, in March, we were trending at about 400% year over year growth. So the, the business, you know, March over March was 4X. On these financial services, we also um, had successfully launched hotels. Um, we had car rental coming out. It was a very different business model than what we would have had like even a year ago. Uh, and so the round would have probably been you know, two to 400 million. Um, it was just the kind of thing, you know, where we were at, at the inflection point. So it ended up being a, a, a backstop just to make sure we had enough cash to, 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 to survive whatever was coming. Um, and we were just very quiet about announcing it. We actually picked up two new investors and a lot of the existing investors we had participated. So I, I want to, it wasn't 200 to 400 million, but have you announced no. what it was? Uh, it was it's about 70 million. Right, okay. so that's what we ended up putting in, um, and that gave us enough cash to um, is basically put the company at the highest cash point it ever had because we'd been doing well in terms of burn rate and all the types of things that you would imagine um, as per the revenue growth I was talking about. Um, and what has happened since is our business has actually recovered um, quite a bit, and so we just have, we're just in a very good position. And as I said, we're just very fortunate. Some of it is luck, some of it is timing, some of it is paranoia, but we just consider ourselves extremely lucky to be in that stance right now. Okay, so let's talk a bit about 
hopper and what it has traditionally been about. It's traditionally been about forecasting, correct? Um, and, and push notifications and predictions, that sort of thing, based on this massive database of prices that you capture from the airlines and the GDSs. I know we spoke in, I think, 2018, you said you were taking in about 300 billion prices every month, um, as well as looking at what's being shopped in real time on every OTA, every meta search. How does that change when travel comes to a standstill? And what, what does that do to your AI? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, so a lot of crazy things happen. First of all, all of the flight prices drop to a historic low. Um, and then the nature of travel changed. All business travel disappeared. And as we're doing this right now, resume, it hasn't come back. So if you look at the Hopper app, there's this thing that we sort of invented, which is the colored calendar. It sounds ridiculous to say, but we we're the first people to put colors like, you know, green is cheap, red is expensive. Today, when you look at it, um, on the app, it's 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 an all leisure world. You can fundamentally see that uh, weekends are more expensive than weekdays, right? And so the only way that that happens is if there's no business travel, which is as we as we're filming this is what's happening right now. Um, right. So there's a, a huge amount of disruption around that. The second thing that we saw, um, you know, and, and I go to the you know April and 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 you know. March and April time frames, um, you had more cancellations coming in. Like so, almost everybody was negative in terms of transactions. We were refunding more. And then the other thing that happened is, for the first time since the the era of Howard Hughes, almost every ticket became refundable. Right? So there was so much disruption in the structure of the pricing that everything changed. What is interesting is um, because the algorithms are learning algorithms, so we, we're, we're the first company to actually put real AI on top of forecasting, um, we were kind of surprised at how they, 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 they adapted. And you know, in the first two quarters of the year, it was very simple. Everything said buy. Right? Because you just right. you're like, why wouldn't you buy it? It's fifty dollars. This four hundred dollar flight is fifty dollars. So you would think that the algorithms broke, but they just became very, very accurate. They told the whole planet to buy, and at a time where nobody was buying, right. so the whole thing got 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 canceled out. So it, you would think that they could have been wrong, but because of that, actually, they, everything switched to buy. What's been interesting is as demand starts to come back. So uh, TSA in the U.S. is about forty five percent back. China's about a hundred. So you you have different states of recovery and now the lockdowns in Europe are kind of tipping things backwards. The algorithms have just been learning. The, the, the risk of them being wrong was when we went off the cliff. As demand builds up very gradually, the shape of the recovery is, is like a Nike swoosh, right? If you think of what, what it was, like a cliff and it's building up gradually, mm -hmm. the algorithms are very good at adapting to that. So bizarrely, um, everything went Perfectly. Nothing. We never gave bad advice to our customers around this. Um, so, and just a couple of additional questions around that. Is there more manual work involved then at times like this versus just relying on the machine learning and the systems? And then also, does the 2020 data potentially get thrown out as an anomaly? We, we hope. <laughs> the, um, there's no manual work in the forecasting. So all of that has been a computer since I'm going to say early 2014. It's, it's, it's all, and it already had... Um, it already had deep learning around things like holidays or uh, events. Like think of a, you know, something like a convention in Las Vegas back when that was still a thing. If you remember when we used to get in convention centers and sneeze on each other, right? That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, so those events were were large enough that at the route level they would they would disrupt the forecasting. And we got really good over the years because we've been doing this for a while now at adapting to that. Holiday seasons. Um, things like Easter that move around were just very disruptive. Um, but the way that airline revenue management work uh, works, it was, it was always possible to do the right thing in terms of the forecasting outcome. Now what's interesting is that most airlines have turned off revenue management. So I don't know if you've interviewed any airline revenue managers, but most will basically openly say they're not running a lot of machines. It's people setting prices flatly. Turns out that's very easy to forecast. Um, will this data be not anonymously? Absolutely. Hopefully, or everybody's praying for that. Um, right. What's going to happen in 21 and 22 is a really interesting question because the 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 algorithms look backwards. They look at what yeah. happened in the previous years, right? The good news is we have um, right before the lockdowns. Now the volumes are a bit lower, but we were taking a, in about 
700 billion prices. So maybe we more than doubled the, the number oh. that I gave you last time we spoke. And um, when I you, you look at how that works, we now have an archive that contains, I think it's 17 or 18 trillion prices, it's like a ridiculous amount of data. So if we had started accumulating our data in you know 19 or 20, to be honest, we would probably be screwed. Like the 21 would be impossible to forecast, but we have enough historic data that I'm pretty sure we're gonna be able to build a, a decent uh, recovery platform. Okay, interesting. So one of the changes in consumer behavior due to COVID has been an increased desire for flexible terms before making a purchase, moving that really above price as the top consideration. And I know just a few weeks ago, Hopper introduced or officially announced uh, several new flexible travel options. Yep. Can you tell us a bit about those and what kind of interest you're seeing there? Yeah, that's probably the the single most important change in our business. And the the most shocking fact about where we are now is we are going to close this year at 100% growth on revenue, um, even though the, the pandemic has destroyed demand. So there's a, wow. it, it sounds almost impossible. And, and there's a couple of factors that have nothing to do with Hopper and have to do with the market. So first of all, almost all inter international travel is shut down, but we have a very uh, large presence in the US. And their demand, as I said, if you look at the TSA data, which is remarkably useful right now, um, is you know demand was 40 45 and you had some months um that was almost tipping on 50 percent back because the us has a lot of domestic travel we're also you know fairly large in mexico and, and canada and there's there is domestic travel in these markets where a smaller country like colombia there's not a lot of you know internal travel um so that's factor number one number two we're massively skewed to uh, millennials as everybody knows because we're app only because of how we built the brand um you know almost 70 percent of our customers are are in the millennial bracket now the millennials millennial one the oldest group there um is turning i think it's 37 or 38 it's it's actually turning into a real generation they have kids now and everything the more surprising demo now is gen z so that generation you know the, the tip of it is going to be 21 19 depending where you look at it so normally a generation demographically is is nine years this one only has six where they can travel because you have to be 18 to buy a ticket right. um and that group is 25% of our customer base. So we're even hyper skewed to Gen Z right now. And so the reason this is relevant is because um, those are the people that are, you know, kind of less worried about getting sick, right? They're the ones that you saw on the beaches and they're the ones traveling. Um, and so our, our audience is naturally more resilient. In reality, our market share um, has tripled in, in the US during the pandemic. Wow. And that's a factor of the demographic shift. I'd love to tell you it's because we're awesome, but it's not. It's because, <laughs> it's because the, the reality of this is our, our customers are, the, are disproportionately traveling in the, in, the, in the sad. So fundamentally, that's part of it. Um, the other part is these financial services, as you were mentioning. And yeah. so um, I could talk maybe a little bit about what those are. I think it's kind of useful to kind of describe that. Um, sure, uh, if you want to just to quickly run through what those are and yeah. give us a sense of what you're seeing. So... The, the, the comical way to think of this is that our revenue model is based on anxiety right now. Um, so we, 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 we hit this junction where we, we reached maybe 35 million downloads. We have about 50 now, 50 million downloads for scale. Um, and so, you know, we're at 30, 35 million downloads. And, you know, it's just very, very difficult to monetize air, right, as we know, because people you know, sometimes blame the airlines. I disagree with that statement. It's because the air margins are just very, very low. There's a lot of competition. And, you know, keeping an airplane safely up in the air is expensive, right? Like you, you know, you have to own airports and baggage trucks and radar and all these things. So uh, it's just a very difficult category to monetize because there's not a lot of margin to go around, right? Especially when you're doing leisure and we're 90% leisure. Um, right. So fundamentally, if you look at some of our air only competitors, a lot of them monetize punitively. So they'll mark up baggage, uh, you know, or seat selection fees, right? right. So if, if the airline charges 40, if you book on them, they'll charge 80 and they'll only tell you once you've booked your ticket, right? So there's a lot of, of websites that, that market that way. They'll put a bare bones fare on the meta search site. They'll get the, the customer and then they'll do that. A lot of them uh, also will do things like they will double the change fees. So if, if the airline you know used to charge you two hundred dollars, they'll charge you four hundred, and there's nothing you can do at that point because they own the the PNR, they own the the ticket at that point. Um, you can't just call the airline and switch it over. So 
we looked at this at the beginning of 2018 and we said, could we do the exact opposite? Could we build a series of products that instead of being punitive to our customers were better, right? And so very quickly you say, well, could we take a ticket that is by default non-refundable? So today people um, forget this, but still three quarters of what is being bought in the US at least is basic economy. And that's not refundable, that's not changeable. Right. It used to be that regular economy wasn't, and now it sort of is sometimes, but fundamentally, three quarters of the leisure purchases, which is three quarters of everything right now, is just not refundable. The fact that you can change every ticket is just not true, right? The other thing is, well, maybe you want to cancel it. And sometimes the travel insurance cover, but you know the acceptance rate of travel insurance? It's like in the low 30s, right? And then you have to file paperwork, you have to have a medical reason. So we just said, what if we made everything changeable? What if we charge like a, an incremental fee to the ticket price and you, you could buy off, you know, basically a la carte what you want to do? Do you want to make this ticket cancelable? Do you want to allow yourself to change some dates? And then we also introduced a product um, which is now, it, it, it's about 30% of what we sell on a, on a transaction basis that we call price freeze. So we basically let you hold a price. And there's a whole um, spectrum of ways you can do this. One of them is you need... 24 hours to make up your mind. You have to talk to your spouse. You got to confirm your hotel booking. Maybe for $15 or $17, we'll just hold the price. Uh, maybe you want to lock in a price for 21 days for a different price, obviously more expensive. We will take a price that could go up, could go down. We'll lock it for you. If it goes up, you pay what you, the price that, you, you, that you, 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 you would pay when you froze it. If it goes down, you pay the lower. And in the price freeze product, let's say you pay $50 to hold a ticket for two weeks. We will literally credit that to your booking. So if you go and buy the ticket, this service was free. You can imagine how that completely transforms the shopping experience. Now, making all of these things changeable and freezing prices is super cool, but it's a great way to lose enormous amounts of money as a business. Like there's an enormous amount of risk in offering these things. And the way that we do it is we take this risk on our PL. This is why I've started to call Hopper a financial services company. Like we, we actually carry enormous amounts of risks, which is a software company and a, an OTA doesn't do that. That's just typically not how like those companies view themselves. And so the fact that we offered these is cool. The fact that we do it in an app is cool. The real magic is that we make money. It's, so, and that comes down to it only works because we fully understand all future pricing in air. It's the same data, not different algorithms, but the same data that we've been accumulating for almost a decade now that lets us do this. And it's also because we're on the phone and we see our customers 120 days before they buy. So we have all of this time and all of these micro interactions to understand you as a customer. Even if you're not logged in, we, we kind of understand that. And so with these two data sets, we're able to price something that you can't buy anywhere else. We're able to say, hey, for you, the risk on this particular flight you want to take is $17. If you're willing to give us $17, we will hold this price for you. So you're like the bank of Hopper now, kind of. Um, <coughs> more, it, you know, it's not an insurance product, but we, we are basically taking risk, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, I guess you could call it a hedge fund more. Like that's probably okay. even closer to it. If you think of the, if you're trying to make a, an analogy to the finance world where we are okay. pooling risk together in, in, in a protection product, it's not an insurance product. None of these are, but we're just basically, um, I guess another way to think about this, we were right in our forecasting 95% of the time which was great for 95 out of 100 people. But what about these other five right. that, where we, we gave you the wrong advice, right? So we started thinking of the problem this way and we said, well, couldn't we pool the entire risk of the 100 and make it okay for everybody? And fundamentally what these products are is that everybody pays a little bit and everybody gets a good outcome. So, you know, you just made reference there to, I think you said 120 days, about what, four months, uh, three, four months, people coming in and interacting in the app. But I know I just heard your product manager, Linda Abraham at the ATP Co event say that now more than 50% of your users are booking trips within the month. Yep. Whereas pre COVID, you know, there was that much longer lead time and you were seeing people more and all of that. Yep. How does that impact you? And, and are you suited for that spontaneous travel? 
So what happened is that the booking windows, the advanced purchase windows, shrunk a bunch, right? They would have been at 45 to 90 days, more skewed towards 90 on mobile. Um, the hotel booking has always had a high component of last minute, just because we're on the phone. It's just a natural use case, as, as you know, Hotel Tonight, for example, would have proven. Um, right. So the, those have shrunk, right? Hotels got to a point where the average was like four days before. And this was fundamentally because people were just driving for short stays or things like that. And a lot of the travel that we see now is visiting friends and family, the one that the, the travel that's done through air. So you basically have seen a polarization of demand. If you're flying, most of it's friends and family. Very few people are going on vacation, like a proper vacation. Right. And if you're staying at a hotel, it's usually a shorter stay where you're just trying to get away for a weekend, right? And somewhere in between, there's kind of the VRBO, Airbnb. People are staying in a home because there's no common spaces and it's you know less dangerous for, for the COVID. Um, fundamentally, the segments are like hyper fragmented now. You can kind of tell what somebody's shopping for immediately. But at Hopper our main action isn't selling you something, it's, it's watching, it's tracking prices, it's talking to you. And that conversation is not really shortened. Maybe okay. a little bit, but it's mostly because there's no international travel. So even though people are booking at the last minute, mostly because there's not a lot of revenue management, you know, they wanna make sure they can go. What if you know, my state rules for your quarantine change, there's so much uncertainty. They're doing two things. They're booking shorter, but they're also loading all these protection products. Right. So right now, for every travel transaction that we sell, we sell about 1.3 of these financial products, whether that's traditional travel insurance and making flights changeable, cancelable or freezing prices. So in in April, we were selling a lot more of that than travel because anybody who was traveling was by full necessity and they wanted everything loaded. And also a four hundred dollar flight was fifty dollars. Right. So there's right. a big, right. big difference there. Okay, so we have a question from the audience. Can you give an overview of your revenue model? Is it referral based like the meta sector or would you be open to new revenue streams if they were incremental perhaps on your site or via email beyond just the mobile app? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we're, 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 we are a fully structured OTA. So we ticket, we do customer service, we, we, we function exactly like a traditional OTA on the travel side of the shop. And we do this for air, obviously hotels, and we have car rentals where we're full OTA. Um, the reason we don't do Meta um, is, is simply because it sort of doesn't really work on the phone. People on the phone are gonna launch one app and they're gonna transact through it. And we think it's very, very important that we have proper pricing control. Um, so I'll give you the perfect example of this. If we were not selling the airline ticket, we could not effectively credit the price freeze. So we, we, we've always thought it was super, super important to have that. The other thing too is by being an OTA, um, our airline partners fully see what we do. It's transparent. And we, we've always taken the high road. We don't do any squirrely stuff. We don't, we don't you know, pass you know, various tricks to you know, hide volumes or things like that. But more openly, all these financial products, we never launch them if they're detrimental to an airline. It, it, it has to protect the airline's revenue per seat. And so the only way you can do these things properly, so both for the customer that's buying and the customer that's letting us book on a, on a plane or in a hotel is by having a, an OTA platform. Right now, about anywhere between 70 and 75% of all of our revenue comes from these financial products. Okay. We make a surprisingly low amount of money off of the travel, and that is by design. I'm gonna quote Jess Bezos by saying, you know, your margin is my opportunity. We entered two decades late into a category where there's three giants that own almost every brand. So you're not gonna generate a high margin business in travel if you're doing this. We were literally 30 years late to do that. And we actually believe, um, contrary to how you opened it, people are still very, very price sensitive. Like we're seeing, we're seeing lowest fare go just as much as it did before, even though the actual price is lower, um, at least in the US. And because even at 50% discount, travel is still expensive for a lot of people that are traveling. So we try to make sure that we're always price competitive. And we have a whole bunch of new products coming out around that too. 
And, and, and so just quickly, as we're talking specifically about that experience of search and shop and, and booking and all of that, you know, now content is so important for consumers as far as understanding, you know, the travel restrictions are changing, it seems like every day. And do you have to quarantine? Do you not? And what's open and all of that? Are you able? Um, are you communicating any of that? And is there a challenge with the limited real estate of a mobile app, you know, your mobile, uh, your app only? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, we felt that that was a problem before, that on mobile, the websites were not particularly transparent about the change policies and what you were actually buying. And we saw this when we got hit in our own customer support. So I think it's almost four years ago, maybe five, we introduced this thing called the Fair Bear. Um, so we, we're known for bunnies, right, that find you a deal. Um, right. This is kind of our brand. But we introduced this other animal, which is this giant brown bear that's there to have your back, right? And it was kind of a joke, like the bear is fair, like that's, that's what it got called <laughs> the fair bear. And what it initially did, um, and it's still in the app today, is it just, just, just gave you the fair details in a transparent way, right? And since we've done a whole bunch of things, so we are um, one of the only OTAs that has next generation search. On, on our display. So if you, you can open up the app, you can swipe between like a real carousel of fares. And one of the founding principles of our air stack is that we actually tell you what you're buying, even if it's bad, even if it's something that's going to you know cost us money, even if our margin is higher or whatever, right? We always tell you if you're buying something that's not changeable, doesn't include a bag and all those things. So I'm really happy we took that stance. It was the right thing to do, but it, we, we've always had the infrastructure. So for us, changeability, COVID impact, um, it was the same kind of thing. It's the same infrastructure that we used to tell you you needed a visa to go to this place, right? And so we, we've always had this hyper customer centric stance on, on pricing and fair rules and restrictions. We just opened it up. And so one example of this is even though we make money on making uh, non-refundable tickets refundable. If you open the app, nap, the app today, you'll see on the home screen it says a lot of things have no change fees, right? Okay. And we, we're just upfront about it. We never let our own monetization get in the way of doing the right thing for the customer. And I think that's one of the things that served us particularly well in this pandemic. So let's talk a bit now about uh, more about your hotel strategy. You've referenced it. Um, launched, I think, about three years ago, fall of 2017. Yep. Um, and I know pre-COVID, you know, there was talk about really expanding that globally and adding alternative accommodations. What has happened in that space? So candidly, we, we failed at building a good hotel product for two of those three years. We, we're actually very good at failing because we try things differently and we, we do a lot of things wrong and we just couldn't get any traction um, around that. And it's, it's obvious because it's not like air. The anxiety is not the same about the price. Even though our data said that you should be worried about this, people are not. They always think that there's a better deal they can get. And it's kind of true. You can always kind of haggle your way into a lower rate last minute in a hotel or something like that. Um, so as you would imagine, the last minute segment, like the, you know, I'm going to book for today or tomorrow because I'm already in the market, that took off pretty easily. But it's, it's not a huge part of the market. And, right. you know, there are, there are formidable companies, you know, that have done great work consolidating supply in, in, in hotels. Right? These platforms are amazing. Like the, the companies we compete against, I, I admire in hotels. They're very, very strong. Um, so we had to build something different. And so our fundamental advantage there, and we always start with price because that's what our customers want, just generally, no matter how how rich you are and what kind of hotel you're staying in, you always want a better deal. It's just, it's just how it is, right? And so fundamentally, we built our platform on multi-sourcing, which is basically to say we went and we connected to everything and everybody that distributes, and almost everybody does. And we have one huge advantage. You can see a price in the app, but you watch a hotel. Right? Hopper's always been about watching. And at that point, it's a closed user group. I can send you a push notification with a rate that's private, right? And airlines don't do a lot of this for a good reason. The margins are low, but hotels do this stuff all the time. The other thing too is I'm talking to you for a hundred days about your air. So I can start at the right time once you're getting close to booking or once you've booked, talk to you about these great package deals. And these rates, these closed user group rates in hotels, they are between 10 and 70% cheaper. So today, we have almost every hotel in the world. We, we will usually look at between five to seven different databases for the best private fare. 52% of the time, we are cheaper than anywhere on the web. 
So if you go to Google Hotel Finder, anything, and it's telling you this is the cheapest rate that you have, if you just watch the same hotel in Hopper, you will get a, a lower rate. Not surprisingly, our hotel business has just been growing like crazy. Before the lockdown, we were growing at about 1,700% year over year. So every month, the thing would double or triple. And even now, like this month, so the October that just closed, it is our largest month in hotel revenue and sales. And do you have alternative accommodations on there? We, we have about a million properties there. Um, and we're actually working with all the providers um, right now to try to improve that because um, we, we don't rush opportunistic into a category. We only scale it up when we understand it. So we've been testing those for almost two years now, and we think we get it. I think, we, I think we finally understand this category, how it meshes with hotels, how to do it well. And again, there's there's great companies in that space. Like there's three, out of the three big ones, there's two that are completely like incredible at what they do in terms of sourcing supply and getting better rates and all those things. So fundamentally, we want to make sure we understand that. There too, it's going to be the same thing. There's a lot more multi-sourcing than people realize. A lot of homeowners and professional companies multi-list now, very mm -hmm. different than 2015. So we're going to we're gonna really beef up our multi-sourcing strategy to give the customer a holistic view. Um, we, we sort of missed the, 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 the boom of this right now during COVID, but I'm not really bothered about that because, you know, we, we never could have been hustled in three months to build a good product there. So we're starting to expand that out. We're shooting for about five to six million properties by the end of the year. Just to give you an idea, we're looking to five or six X the, the okay. inventory we have there. Right now, it's a, it's a toy. If you use us in, look at us in LA, we're kind of laughable, to be completely okay. honest. I appreciate your honesty. Yes. Um, so we have another question from a viewer. Where does Hopper stand with its NDC project launched by Lufthansa? Um, it is going to get rolled out like eminently. Um, yeah. And so we've worked really, really hard on that. We have an amazing uh, partnership with Lufthansa Group um, and they've actually, um, so people think this is just about removing the GDS surcharge often, it's not. It, 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 it is like the, the reason that surcharge is there is as a motivation for, for, for marketplaces like us to go in and do this. But, you know, we've had a, a multi-year relationship with Lufthansa where we've pioneered a lot of stuff together. And fundamentally, um, it's about enabling the merchandising properly, right? Allowing any carrier to distribute their product in our marketplace any way that they see fit for their own business model. And so we've done the NDC. Um, we have a couple of direct connects that have been out there for a while already. Um, we're kind of indifferent to the connectivity mode, but more importantly, our display. So you can, if, if anybody listening wants to take a look at the app, you'll see, you know, look at a, a US flight, for example, you'll see that we've actually done the next generation search. Um, and that's something that we actually worked in collaboration with Delta on pretty heavily. And they gave us a ton of feedback on how to do this well. And so we, we actually view the connectivity um, as just an extension of doing the right thing. We view that our marketplace is dysfunctional if airlines and hotels don't want to participate in it. So we always try to do the right thing. And the NDC connection is just one example of that. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about uh, who is your competitor, would you say, or one or two? Look, you, you like, we openly compete against Expedia Group, Booking Group, and 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 C Trip Trip Group, right? At the end of the day, like anybody who is trying to sell leisure travel is is somebody that is potentially taking a Hopper customer and convincing them to book on you know their website or or their app. And by naming those through groups, I've named almost every brand that that exists out there. There's just very few independent companies. We also compete about, uh, with any website or app that doesn't belong to one of those three giants, right? Before COVID, travel was about a 700 billion category, depending on you know what part of focus right you trust for for the for, for the market <laughs> size. And mobile, you could piece together um, as about a 250 billion dollar you know category. Right now, it's more than half, but it's going to come back. So we view ourselves as competing against anybody who who any other OTA or marketplace who sells travel, and we consider the meta search sites to be the same thing. What about Google? Um, Google doesn't sell as of now, but they have book on Google and we, we absolutely view them as a competitor. And we spend very little time um, worrying about Google or what anybody else does. We spend all of our time worrying about our customer because at the end of the day, Google's never going to pay me. 
The person that's going to pay me is the person buying travel from me. So we spend no time worrying about them. But we're also very different. We don't do SEM or SEO. We right. do not advertise on Google. So it doesn't, for us, it doesn't matter from a funnel perspective what Google does or doesn't do with their flight or their hotel product. We exist in the in the in the mobile world for that reason because we think that the the headbutting of you know buying space SEM SEO fair search is just it's just a dead end so we've avoided it since our inception and we continue to do so. I mean, I'm just curious. Anything that you think Google Flights does well? They are the only technology group that we really fear. Um, they're very good at data. They they also have this customer first approach. They're good at innovating. They try things. Um, they're also just because it's it's such a small piece of the bigger Google machine. They can take risks with their business, like the travel part of the business, that some of the the the, the other companies like us can't always take in terms of the the PNL. No, we have a we have a ton of respect for what those guys are doing. And one of the things that. Um, we worry about the most is they seem to be customer obsessed. They will never do something that's going to harm the Google user as a whole. And we view that as our biggest competitive advantage. So we, we take very, very seriously any competitor who puts the customer ahead of their own short-term revenue. Right? And so, so yeah. you know, they, they don't bias their results. Sure, they have tons of advertising and they're doing all sorts of things that are potentially debatable in the SEM, SEO space. And I'm sure a lot of your, your, your other interviews have talked about this. But fundamentally, when you look at their products, they're designed with the customer in mind. And we always find that scary because that's where we think the competition is. Yeah. Ultimately, that's the winning strategy. Huh? Yes. Um, so let's talk again about the OTAs. What changes do you expect to see in the OTA landscape potentially as a result of COVID and how that might evolve? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you have to step back from just pure OTA and you have to look at the category to answer that well. Um, I'll make a few predictions. You can tape, we're taping this. We'll see if I'm right in a few years. <laughs> okay. um, I don't think uh, business travel ever comes back to where it was before. And the reason is what we're doing now, right? So at Hopper, for example, we were distributed in seven cities before we the pandemic, and we still are. And, you know, in June, we announced that we would let anybody move anywhere. So we had people move to Whistler and Hawaii, and, you know, they just work for us from there forever. Um, and we're not the only ones that did this, right? So a lot of the big tech giants just basically opened that up. Um, but the vast majority of people did not work on Zoom seven hours a day. Right. If you go to a Hopper, you know, conference room and where I am now in our Montreal office, or very empty Montreal office, um, they're all split. It's like half a table and a wall because we were on video all the time. We were just built that way, and that's because we started with two offices. Like we were founded in two cities, pretty much. Um, but now, over two billion people have learned to work on Zoom, right? And so, any CFO that was saying, um, you know, all this travel is not necessary. Like all this, all these events, all this visiting of customers, and all, like they got the A B test of the millennial, like millennium, right? Like, like it, it sort of wasn't, right? The other thing that's happened too is people realize that commuting sucks, right? So I'm really worried for all the corporate downtown real estates, all these businesses that you know run off of, uh, off of you know the lunch break and things like that. I think the whole like the whole office and corporate travel thing is gone structurally forever. There'll be something; it'll never go to zero. But I don't think that's not that's going to come the same. And the reason this matters is because although corporate and and leisure bookings were 50-50, again almost since the time of Howard Hughes, um, the revenue was highly skewed towards corporate. Right, like just the amount of profitability that you would get as a hotel, an airline, or a seller of anything, uh, and so the entire industry is going to have to rebalance its margin structure in a world where corporate is depleted. Now, I'm forecasting once the vaccines kick in, um, you know, and we stabilize the the, the pandemic, you're going to see a whole lot of revenge travel. Revenge travel, like that's the term that the the kids yes. use, like in the U.S., right? And so. When you look at uh, you know household debt, credit card repayment, people have a ton of money. Like, look, how are you going to spend it? You like in a bunch of places, you can't even go like to a restaurant anymore, right? Like, including where I am right now, where everything's closed. So people have accumulated a ton uh, of of income, and it's actually not going to long term debt. They're not like paying down their mortgages faster. They're holding it to do things like travel and entertainment and all these other things. So you're going to see, I think, a very big leisure boom like once this thing is under control. 
So, but fundamentally, the profitability is not going to be the same structurally because of the corporate thing I, I explained. So, I think you're going to have, you're going to see that, you know, prices are going to inch back up. A lot of the airlines or hotels are going to keep their rates relatively low. To give you an idea, for us, our average order value has always been about four hundred dollars. Right, like it's it's like we didn't have a chart for it, and we have a chart for everything at Hopper. We didn't even have a chart; it was pointless. It was it was like watching paint dry, and now it's it it moves every week, right? And, and so it it's gone as low as below two hundred, and it's it, it's 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 inched its way up to three hundred, and it goes up and down, and we track that as like a a very core metric because a lot of our revenue is attached to that. But it also tells you that the suppliers that have the fixed costs are are, are very very worried about that, and so. Fundamentally, in a world with extreme price volatility, decreased profitability, we think only the innovative companies are going to do well, right? Like this whole thing of everything stable. You you put five billion into Google and you get seven or eight billion back. We think those days are gone, right? Now, are those companies going to fold? Absolutely not. There a lot of them are formidable, but we don't think that the kind of casual, you know, just keep doing what you're doing last year with five percent growth is going to hold for even the recovery. Okay. Um, wow. I'm realizing I wish we had a little bit more time because there's a lot to get into here. So we are getting a little bit tight. Let's try to run through some more questions here. We do have another one from a viewer. It says, hi, Fred. Good to see you on the series. You talked about your inflection point in the business earlier. More broadly, what up and coming travel brands do you think have their own inflection point coming? That's a really interesting one. Um, so obviously, the one that is the most interesting to watch right now is partially because we know those guys well, but is what Airbnb does. So the IPO is scheduled, um, and they've they've gone from this phase where they were trying to become multi. Pandemic hit like everybody else. Now they're fully, fully focused on their core business. So th the real question to me is how how disruptive is Airbnb Airbnb going to be in the long run? Right? Like, what else are they going to build around that? And uh, like, that team is just so different than any other like of the big travel companies. And obviously, what they built is like stupefying. Like, if you look at the growth of that company, um, so we're very, very interested in um, what they're going to do in terms of their multi-product strategy. Um, so that's one of them. There is a real big boom in tours and activities. So companies raising you know hundreds of millions and you know great founder teams starting those things. That got like disjointed. Um, but the activity space was fundamentally interesting because it created high frequency. And if you're in the app business, like like we are, high frequency is the difference between life and death because you don't rely on all this Google free SEM SEO, right? So fundamentally, how those businesses recover, like how they're going to innovate, super interesting. I'm very interested in the meta category because the meta search model doesn't work on mobile. And if anybody tells you it does, they're lying. Right. Fundamentally, you just can't get the same unit economics because clicking in and out of something doesn't work. So you've seen um, companies that have like a formidable content base, like TripAdvisor, formidable reach, like Kayak and Skyscanner. Those guys um, are trying to figure out their mobile business still, right? So they, they have great brands, people trust them. Um, and then there's also the book on Google, which is the, the most extreme version of that. So how that plays out post pandemic in my, in my idea is like fascinating. So the real question is once you reset everything, demand comes back, you know, corporate is kind of disjointed. What are all these third party companies going to do to adapt to the new reality? Um, one that I'm a, a big fan of um, is Ariel's company, Trip Actions. They had built something uh, like, like it was amazing. I'm a big fan of Ariel just to start with. Um, and obviously, they're, they're, you know, like, you know, I, I almost want to hug him. Like, I, if you're listening <laughs> and like, I, I feel you, but I have a sense that they're going to come back and they're going to figure this out too. And so, Fundamentally, if you want to tie one string around what I'm saying is it's all about the companies that are innovating. We fundamentally think the only way to, to get market share is to, is to invent something new. And we think that, that the pandemic and the post-pandemic are going to, it's going to shine a spotlight on the companies that think that way, that focus on that versus just collecting rent on the empire. Okay. Um, so we have another question. Um, you obviously sit on a fantastic wealth of data. Have you ever thought about how you can monetize this with a B2B audience, such as airlines, airports, hotels, tourism, OTAs, et cetera? I'm, I'm glad you, you, this question came up because it would have avoided me the shameless self-promotion that I'm about to do. So um, <laughs> the, one of the things that we launched um, about three months ago, we've been quiet because we're testing it, but we have a, a couple of companies that have already signed up is, 
all of these financial products that we, we've, we've built for ourselves, they're available in a B2B offering. And so we were going to continue to test and roll out, but we're actually talking to, to customers. So if, if you are a, a, an OTA, a made a search site, um, even an airline or a hotel company, and you believe that your future um, goes through being more customer centric, decreasing the risk of purchase. So, you know, the, 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 the cancellation risk pools that allow tickets to become refundable, the changeability pools. We have missed connection insurance um, also. So if you miss a connection, it used to be you'd have a flight every 20 minutes. Now you can end up stuck for two days in some place because there's so little flights. Um, we have a, the price freeze product. All of those things we are licensing as a B2B product. We have a full-blown sales team that's been doing this. We have support. And so there's two important things there. One, it comes with the data infrastructure, so you don't, you don't see it, but we've, we've spent, my God, it must be over 100 million now building this thing. Uh, like, I'm almost ashamed to say that. It's just such a complicated <laughs> problem to, to solve. And so you can just benefit from that. And it's obviously, it's basically a rev share. So you, know, you don't have to spend $100 million to start offering this to your customers. And the most important thing about that, if you're thinking of, of trying to build one of these products, is when all those cancellations came in, People were refunding more than they were making. Well, these financial products are non-refundable, right? Like you, you get your refund for the travel purchase, but we don't refund you the cost of the insurance to get the refund, which is obvious, right? So you get all the benefit of the risk models, but you get a stable revenue stream. And even in a world where there probably will not be like hopefully another lockdown at the scale that we saw in April, cancellations are at 12, 15% where they used to be two or three. Right, just because things change, the, the rules change all the time on the lockdowns. So just having a revenue stream that is constant, if you have a spike of refund, it, it is just so beneficial. So we, we basically offer that to any provider of direct travel services or any marketplace or OT or Meta that wants to add our technology and services. Think of it as um, a hopper cloud, like an AWS. It's, it, we, 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 one of the ways to view this is risk as a service. We basically allow you to provide these protection products to your customers. And we, we actually are providing the risk and the infrastructure as a, as a service, the same way we, you would use Microsoft Azure or, or, or Google Cloud. Um, needless to say, there's a lot of demand for those products. Like, we're, like as we start to, to, to market this, um, it just makes so much sense to, to partner with us on that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, it's all very, very interesting um, what you're developing there. So just give us a sense as we're getting ready to wrap up here. You know, I think I saw on your website, you have about 40 open positions, if I saw that correctly. So I, that seems like a good sign. Um, you may be, yeah, we're, you may be we're the most optimistic guy in travel that I've talked to I in mean, a while. So it, what's next for you? What's I have I have mixed feelings about this part, um, but at some point we have to, you know, we have to say how things are. Um, doubling our revenue is in this year is stupefying, right? And I, I say this and my heart goes out, you know, to the, the trip actions out there that, that have probably another year of figuring this out. Um, there's other great companies. One of them is a sister company and one of our, our investors funds is plus great. Like they, they built a great product to upgrade international flights. And just like, I just feel really terrible for any other executive or CEO that's listening when things aren't going well. So, you know, my heart goes out to you guys, but we're, we're doing good because a lot of it was timing and luck, right? And having right. This, this data stack. Um, so yeah, we're, we, you know, we're growing our team again. And I also feel bad because um, you know, we had to let a lot of people go. Like, you know, we did close to 200 layoffs. And for us, that's a lot of people. Like I know some companies had to do more. And again, my heart goes out to all these people that, that lost their employment. Um, the only good thing about that is we've been able to rehire some great people we let go. <laughs> and, and they were gracious enough to come back. Like, I can't thank them enough for, you know, like going through that. So uh, this was a horrible year for everybody. And it's still super hard. Like I, I want to, you know, just keep reminding people, this is a dangerous disease and people are dying, right? So we, we even have mixed feelings about making sure we don't contribute to the problem. So, um, you know, we, we try to push as much as we can, like the, the safety measures, but fundamentally, like, it's a good year for us and probably the year would have been stellar. Um, but we think we're in a good position. So yeah, we're hiring, the hiring rates accelerating. We think it's going to continue to grow. We're very cautious because this could go on. People think this is months, but I think we have another year of this, unfortunately. So we, uh, like of the, the actual disease being, you know, rampant everywhere. So we're very cautious about this, but you know, we are hiring and we are growing. 
Um, and one final question that has come in, you mentioned Amazon Web Services. What about its sister company, you know, Amazon.com? Does its travel ambitions scare you at all? Um, everything about competing against Amazon is terrifying or your head's not screwed on right. If you're a CEO and you, you have anything that overlaps with Amazon, it would be so easy to cross Puget Sound and, and just buy the whole thing that's sitting on the other side, right? So the real question is why haven't they done it, right? Like why haven't they picked up Expedia or anything like that? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, um, we're not, we're not going to sell to Amazon. <laughs> like, we're not going to sell to Google. We're not going to sell to Amazon. Um, we would be crazy to sell, and, and I'm having way too much fun. So, like, Hopper's not, like, doesn't matter the amount. We just wouldn't sell it. But fundamentally, um, you know, Amazon has the, the most robust global, you know, payment system. There's, there's two big companies. There's Alibaba and Amazon that are, are dominant there. Mm -hmm. um, and they have no issues about commerce, right? My personal theory is that Amazon is very, very much built on their fulfillment capabilities. Warehouses, shipping, and you get no advantage out of travel. And so they're pretty smart about this. Um, my two cents, the day will come. Like there's just no way. Like they're they they they're 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 in uh, pharmacy with the pill pack acquisition, and you're seeing Google verticalize more and more. This is all being driven by mobile. On mobile, you just can't sell clicks the way you can on the on the web, and the world's going to be mobile pretty soon. All of it. I just think they're going to be in the in the category. Um, and the idea of competing directly against Jeff Bezos should be scary to anybody who's listening to me. Like for good reasons, they've earned it. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Fred, thank you so much for sharing your insights with all of us. Thanks to our great engaged viewers who submitted some great questions for you and appreciate your openness in answering those. And once again, we'd like to thank our partners at Medallia, who can show you how to use text messaging to remove non-essential interactions, provide a superior sense of safety, and deliver an unrivaled guest experience. Learn more at medallia.com. Fred, thank you again, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.